Hey guys, how are we doing? So we're back on another video from Super Eye Patch Wolf, another Why you Should Watch, JoJo's Part 3, Stardust Crusaders, my favourite of the four parts that I've watched. <sighs> Can't wait for this. And I apologise in advance, I've been having a lot of trouble sleeping recently, so I'm on blah, 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 some energy drinks. Haven't had these for a while, so I don't know how much of a blah, gonna get from this. But I'm excited for this. Got my JoJo's hat with all the stands and Um, <laughs> So let's... uh. Let's get into this. Why you should watch JoJo's Part 3. Stardust Crusaders! That's how far we've yeah. come on this bizarre adventure. Oh, you didn't really think we were going to end the year without covering this This is one, such a good series. <laughs> finally here for us to discuss the most prolific part in all of JoJo's, the legendary part three, Stardust Crusaders, the iconic Kujo. But given the vast success of part two, what was it that caused Araki to so drastically change? It was a change, the was it? Series? And what is it about this change that would so heavily influence not only the rest of JoJo's but Shonen storytelling in general? Uh -huh. And finally, what is it that makes Jotaro Kujo? One of the most widely so recognized cool. and wildly popular characters in the series' just so cool. legendary history. Well, friends, one more time. That is exactly what we're here to discuss. So let's get on a plane to <laughs> Egypt. <laughs> Remember that this <laughs> is most definitely the work of an enemy stand. And My let's God. talk about it. <laughs> why you should watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 3 Stop Stardust Crusaders. <laughs> oh, I love this. It was so epic. The biggest change to part 3 is something that I have been dying to talk about since our first video. Yeah. And that is the addition of stands, stands. to the JoJo's universe. <laughs> so what? Stands are ghost-like beings that are created from the spiritual energy of their user. Yeah. Stands would have massive ramifications not only on JoJo's, but pretty much any shonen series that was created in the decades that followed. Hunter x Hunter, Naruto, oh, okay. One yeah, Piece, yeah. all have been influenced by the existence of stands. Ooh. I think the best way to think of stands, if you're unfamiliar, is that they're kind of like an extra limb. Yeah, they're the an extension. The exceptions don't have their own personality and are understood to be a physical manifestation of the stand user's life force. Mm -hmm. And I think to really get into Purple why heart. stands are such a big deal in JoJo's, we need to follow them right back to their origins in Chinese religion and mysticism. Oh, okay, Namely, cool. The History lesson. Ki, also known as Ki or Chi. Ki is the idea right. that we all have an inner life force flowing within us, mm -hmm. and certain people will claim that with enough physical, mental, or spiritual training, Ki can be harnessed in a multitude of different ways, like such as man, man, healing, <laughs> starting fires with your bare hands, or even knocking someone out without laying a single finger. No way, that's not real. The actual no validity way. <laughs> of Ki is up for debate, Jesus and Christ. not something we're going to get into here, but the reason this is important for storytelling, in particular shonen storytelling, is that Ki was used in the early days of contemporary shonen manga as a narrative excuse that let regular biological humans perform the same kind of superhuman feats that had previously been confined to robotic sci-fi characters like Astro Boy and Kamen Rider. Right, cool. Thus yeah. giving plain old humans the mystical grounding to be able to do things like fly and use laser attacks. Hell yeah, come it might <laughs> seem like a simple concept now, but it dramatically changed the landscape of shonen manga, with 70s sci-fi manga like Mazinger Z, Cyborg 009, and Space Battle Battleship Yamato being replaced oh, which by have had, more like, mystical martial arts based stuff series recent, of the 80s like, like Fist years. of the North Star, Dragon Ball and of course JoJo's. JoJo's. While other series dabbled JoJo. with the idea of JoJo. key, Dragon Ball would be the first major title to push the concept into its contemporary form. And it did this by combining popular elements of sports manga such as training and growing ever stronger with martial arts based key, Boom. which essentially put no limit on how powerful the characters could get over time. And while this was initially a very good thing, it did come with some long-term problems, like supporting cast being pushed further into the background, yeah, that happens. or just flat out running out of ways to express new levels of power. For example, as Dragon Ball went on and continued into Dragon Ball Z, Goku's power could be measured by the size of his Kamehameha yeah. energy blast, with it eventually reaching near galactic proportions. Ridiculous. At which point, you're not really left with very many meaningful ways yeah, like how else to represent can you a do character's professional yeah. power. So stands. Once a character has become this powerful, <laughs> they give those stands weird abilities. What can be seen as a viable uh, they try to each other's which bad abilities. Which also greatly limits the kind of battles that can occur. And this is a barrier that Araki was coming up against at the end of part two. Oh, yeah. Jonathan had defeated a vampire. Joseph. Had 
could be a god. Yeah, I watched Rage Go. There, <laughs> while still keeping the combat encounters relative and interesting. And the answer Araki came to was stands. That's See, such a cool it's idea. not really about how strong a stand is, no. as much as it is what specifically a stand can, can do. do. Each stand has its own unique abilities that come with their own strengths and weaknesses. From the very basic, like Jotaro's close range star platinum, star platinum. who can basically just punch very fast and very very hard yeah. to the more complex ones like centerfolds who can attack you from inside the reflection Mirror, of the mirror yeah, or Araya class. who holds power over magnetism. magnetism. This but essentially they means that there the is crotch. no perfect stand. <laughs> sure, there are insanely overpowered ones, but for the most part, no matter what kind of stand you have, there is someone out there with a perfect counter to yeah. your ability. Which is why Jotaro can go toe to toe with Vampire Lord Dio in part 3 that and get ass kicked by a rat in part 4. This means that Araki never has to worry about the problems that come with long-term power level escalation. A fact proven now that it's nearly 30 years later and we're still getting yeah, stand models that there's feel a rat fresh and that can control The other missiles. genius thing about stands is that they don't require any physical, mental or spiritual training. While there are various different ways to obtain one, you can't really work or study for it. No, and this means that a stand strength uh, is yeah. entirely separate from that of the stand the user. Meaning arrow that literally anyone can have a stand. Like seriously, Dogs, babies, monkeys, polnareff, anything. Physical appearance give no indication of who a stand user might be, nor how dangerous they might become. Mm. And this serves two distinct purposes in the story. For one, it keeps everyone in Jojo's world vulnerable. No matter how strong your stand is, you yourself are still just a plain old human. human yeah. Meaning that you're only ever one wrong move away, away from getting, beat. From getting <laughs> the literal soul aura aura from your body. And yeah. this keeps every fight in JoJo's tense, exciting, and strategic. It really does. As no victory is ever assured. Second, it sells the fantasy that no matter who you are, you could be a stand user just the way you that are right is now. is true as well, yeah. It would take years of training to be able to compete in the Budokai tournaments from Dragon Ball. True, but, but anyone JoJo's could have a stand. World, there's nothing stopping even the most average person from obtaining a stand. Mm. If stands were real, which... I wish they wish were. We were yeah. I think it's also why <laughs> the cast of the Persona games are so much more relatable than your average JRPG cast. They're just a bunch of regular kids, but their Personas give them the fantasy grounding to be able to fight back against the shadows. Similar, yeah. The final and possibly biggest advantage of stands is the level of creativity and diversity it brings to the combat encounters, as no two fights ever even feel remotely similar. No. And it adds this tense puzzle dynamic to the fights. Yeah, there is. It's if like, how does that stand this, work? Then what does mine have to do to be able to counter that? Yeah. And it leads to Brilliant. some really crazy situations. Like, how do you fight someone with no direct offensive abilities except that his stand can turn you into a child oh and he has yeah. an axe we're going to dive <laughs> a little deeper into the fights later on the longer you're in the shadow now, the younger you get we as well about the world and characters of stardust crusaders part three opens up and two things are immediately obvious for one the visuals look like they got a massive bump since part two mm -hmm. and seconds Everyone's favorite walking Dio. nightmare, Dio Brando, is back and he is crazier than What him. an asshole. Right off the bat, what I love about Dio being the villain for this arc is how it recontextualizes part one. Yeah. All of a sudden you realize that Phantom Blood wasn't really Jonathan's story. It was Dio's, and also makes Jonathan a far more tragic character as you realize he didn't really beat Dio. Yeah, he didn't. He just prolonged the vampire's eventual victory. As if Dio himself body. wasn't enough of a threat, he's been lying at the bottom of the ocean for the better part of a century. And aside from just being fucking Dio, he's now crazy with a full-blown god complex and yeah. terrifying new abilities of his stand, oh my god. the world. The and world! The main protagonist and great-great-grandson of Jonathan Joestar alongside his ragtag posse to travel to Cairo and put an end to the maniacal vampire once and for all. And that protagonist is, of course, the iconic... Jotaro Kujo. The phrase badass is overused to the point of redundancy, but Jotaro Kujo is like every badass moment from every film, comic, yes. and TV show squeezed into a single person. Even Clint Eastwood thinks Jotaro's cool. cool. And if Clint Eastwood thinks you're cool, then, that's, yeah. then you probably are. God, that's class! <laughs> that is so cool. Protagonist from parts one to three. Yeah. 
three, as you'll notice there's a huge shift in the way Araki writes his characters. We talked a lot about internal mechanics in our part two video, how Jonathan was very much an externally written character with very little emphasis placed on his inner thoughts or dialogue, yeah. and Joseph was kind of a mix. On the surface he was a cool. creepy trickster, but internally he was a strategic genius. So if we were to well, chart cool, though, cause Jonathan that he carries on into part three is cool. Joseph being both external and internal, Jotaro is nearly entirely internal, meaning that he gives practically nothing away of his own thoughts or emotions. However, despite how little the character shows on the surface, there's always the sense that he has his own internal logic, mm. his own way of dealing with problems and very particular ideas about what's right and wrong. He's quite reminiscent of the steely American crime action stars of the late 70s and early 80s. Characters like Detective Kojak and Dirty Harry, who incidentally, Jotaro's iconic pose was based on. Oh, Jotaro really works cool. as a character on two specific levels. For one, as mentioned above, he's really cool, but this is actively worked into his character and battle style. Unlike Joseph, he keeps his movements to an absolute minimum. Yeah, Any play doesn't he move does much. make is considered, focused, and decisive, mm -hmm. and it's not unusual for him to sit back over the course of an entire battle, only to, in the last realize, minute, reveal bam, some small went. detail that his enemy has overlooked and leads mm -hmm. to their undoing. Much like a hard-boiled crime detective figuring out some vital final clue... That was cool, I was like, wait a minute, that's not the name. <laughs> The I wrote second the wrong level name. is that it leaves Jotaro's actual character as somewhat of a mystery to the viewer. It's often difficult to tell how he feels about any given situation, or even those around him. In fact, at first he seems downright cold. He's disrespectful to his mom and mm, he he is, yeah. <laughs> anything to do with Joseph and the rest of the guys. But then, occasionally, you get these little glimpses into who he really is. Take episode yeah, like he really cares for his mom, he doesn't like to show it. At this point, we've barely seen him show anything but disdain towards his mother, Holly. Mm -hmm. But then he comments that she looks a little pale and checks to see if she's All feeling right, yeah. right. It's a small detail, but it contrasts so much with the way he's been acting up until now that it really strikes a note mm -hmm. and leads us to believe that there might be more to his character than your plain old hooligan badass. This is the kind of writing that makes his character so endearing. He gives very little away, but when he does, it's a big deal. Yeah. And observing him closely and figuring out this side of him is one of the main pleasures of Stardust Crusaders. Yeah, it's class. Jotaro's character arc would continue well beyond part three and even as late as part six. Oh wow, At which cool. point we're still learning things about him that are both surprising and touching. And I think this is a big part of why a character conceived nearly three decades ago remains so popular to this That's day. That's interesting, cool. Jotaro is joined on his journey to Cairo by his posse, the Stardust Crusaders, mm. comprised of his great-grandfather and previous protagonist of Part 2, the irreverent and infinitely likable Josar, the yes. polite and diligent Kakuin, Kakuin, the stoic and reliable Avdol, clown of the group Polnareff, <laughs> and Iggy, who surely wins the award for Best Anime Dog. But Iggy's I think some so members cool. of the group are a little underdeveloped, especially Avdol. That episode really with him and the bird was amazing. In that previous sentence, their strength lies in the endearing well, camaraderie that really, like, between them as the that journey down, continues. Like. It's never the main focus, but we do get a lot of fun little tidbits about the characters, uh. like Kakuin and Polnareff's secret handshake, <laughs> yes. or the fact that Joseph knows Kakuin is indeed Kakuin and not an evil doppelganger, purely by virtue that he refuses to take off his school uniform while sunbathing. <laughs> Joseph's presence among the cast also really drives home the generational aspect of JoJo's. While parts 1 and 2 basically existed in isolation, Part 3 feels much more like a culmination of everything that's led up to this point, yeah, it does, yeah. having direct ties to the two previous parts. And this adds a lot of weight to the proceedings. When Jotaro and Dio finally step out to face each other, there's a real feeling that this is a showdown multiple generations Hell, in the making. Hell yes. I think one aspect of JoJo's that really separates it from a lot of other anime and manga is Araki's fondness for exploring foreign land through his stories. Mm -hmm. It was a huge part of parts one and two, but it is the main focus of I love that three, in part three, where they're traveling different places is cool. Cairo, love it. And I think where part three really shines is how it communicates the idea of the journey. You yeah, saw that's what I like. I love it. Phantom the journey Blood aspect of it is amazing. But for the most part, any globe hopping that happened in those were basically just a beginning point and an end, end point. point. Yeah, there was no Whereas middle. part three is much more focused on the actual act of travel itself. Mm -hmm. And this is another huge aspect of its appeal. Throughout Stardust Crusaders, you can feel what seems like Araki's very genuine fascination with foreign culture. Mm -hmm. He seems to delight in exploring all the strange little eccentricities of each new land. And this gives each individual sub-arc a really distinct setting, look, 
and atmosphere. This really sells the idea that this is a real journey you're on, but what's more, when you've been watching it for a while, you genuinely feel like you're taking a road trip with you and a bunch of your dumb buddies. Another advantage yes. to this road trip style narrative, it's how it's used to set up for the many unique and exciting stand battles of part 3. And I think this can be best summarized with a quote from Araki from Volume 3 of Stardust Crusaders. Right. When I'm traveling, I can feel very lonely. So I appreciate the kindness of strangers from the bottom of my heart. Hmm. Still, sometimes I start wondering why someone is being nice to me. Are they actually evil and planning my demise? Oh. <laughs> Who's my friend? Who's my enemy? Right, okay. The idea of danger coming from an unfamiliar place is a pretty core fundamental fear that mostly anyone will be able to relate to. Mm -hmm. But it's the way Iraqi works this fear into his battles that's really clever. I would say your average fight in media can be broken down into three parts. Engagement, where the two combatants face each other for the first time. Mm -hmm. Struggle, where the actual fight takes place and the characters wrestle for dominance. And resolution, where the winner wins and the loser loses. And from part three onwards, Araki would add a fourth stage, the mystery. Ooh. The mystery takes place usually before our characters of even course, yeah, it's like, in a fight. Who's going to be the stand user? Section of the How's it work? Where something What's going on? around our heroes seems amiss. Yeah or the opponent has not yet properly revealed themselves or their abilities. This means that before the fight can even begin, our boys must figure out if they are being attacked, who's doing it, and how. Yeah. And it's this that relates back to the feeling of unease Araki wrote about. Oh, this God, yeah. adds an extra Turn layer of fear and tension to the battles of part three, as it's never a simple case of just beating up the person in front of you, but instead, figuring out who that person is, is. and what exactly their stand can do. There's always you some, can certainly yeah, see other you're, series you're right. that have this a style of encounter. Fail There's a mystery lot over every kind of show chapter encounter. Black Arc, for example. But no series really commits to it in the same ways that JoJo's does. Take the Tower of Grey fight, where when aboard an aeroplane, our heroes are attacked by a stand user wielding a vicious stag beetle type stand. The enemy is most certainly another passenger on the plane, and this initial mystery adds a terrific layer of tension to the encounter, yeah. as our heroes scramble to figure out who among the crowded aisles is targeting them. The stands also give the fights a huge amount of depth and variety, as it basically takes off all limitations of what a fight can even be. Yeah, it does. There's even several encounters where not a single punch is thrown, and they're some of the most exciting in the entire series. Hmm, yeah, John Rowe's deadly game of poker with oh, Darby the Gambler. Yes. Or Kakuin's life or death video game, video game one, yeah. with Darby Jr. Cool. Other standout encounters include the nightmarish dream battle oh, that was weird. Death 13, which takes place entirely within our hero's dreams, Freddy Krueger style. And my personal favorite, the brutal struggle between amazing the fight, dog Iggy. Ever, Iggy and the unbelievably frightening and intimidating Falcon Pet Shop. Like, Mother's well, Basement so, really downplayed that in his video it's about this. It's a testament like, to both Araki and the animators of this episode that they can make a battle between two animals barely bigger than rodents and make it one of the most nail-bitingly intense awesome. shocking of the entire series. The production of Part 3 is also a significant improvement over Parts 1 and 2. It seems like a lot of work was put into capturing the distinct look and feel of the manga, which is no small feat given how, at this point in his career, wow. Araki had improved to such a degree the detail. that his drawings had reached a new level entirely, feeling all at once densely detailed but also expressive and energetic. While the animation isn't overly elaborate, the character artwork is strong, with a lot of intensely detailed still shots, and I think better represents the style of part 3 than excessive animation might have, and it's all backed up by some really terrific direction. Direction is always important in media, but it's especially important for a show like JoJo's, where a lot of the major plot points involve characters simply realizing things, like the nature of a stand or the identity of its user. Mm -hmm. And the way the colors, tone, and music all shift and work in conjunction to sell yeah. these moments <laughs> is one of the strongest aspects of its Epic. production. Also, a huge shout out to Daisuke Ono, the voice of Jotaro, who right. perfectly captures the character's gruff, stoic exterior while infusing him with enough charm and charisma that he never comes across as too much of a dick, which I imagine was a tough line. To tread. Must be difficult, it's yeah. also worth noting that while Jojo OPs up until this point have been incredibly strong, 
Stand Proud might just be my favourite OP of all time. Studio Kamikaze Doga have really outdone themselves, combining an intensely pounding rock track with some of the most dynamic, exciting and detailed visuals in the business. Yes. If you have not already, go check out Mother's Basement's fantastic breakdown. They're really good. The work and Done reactions to that. Really <laughs> incredible. Unfortunately, there are a few downsides to Part 3. While the stand system offers many advantages over the standard battle system of the time, you can see parts where Iraqi himself is still very much figuring out the Learning details. Learning as he's going, yeah. Star Platinum's powers are a little inconsistent to say the least, mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's a few times when he develops a miraculous new ability in the final moments of a battle that saves the day, it. and okay. honestly it just feels a little cheap sometimes. Stands tend to be at their most interesting when their abilities are limited and specific but it's the creativity of the stand user that makes them dangerous. Some good examples being the lock from part 4, mm -hmm. Bruno's That's portals cool. from part 5, or Jolene's web from part 6. Okay, but I don't know about some that of the broken. stands from part 3 <laughs> feel a little basic. Like, take Abdal's Magician's Red. It can yeah, shoot but if fire, you just started the concept, thing. it's going to be, isn't it? Like can swim pretty good, I guess, which results in the odd stand battle that doesn't really hit home. But given that Araki was still pretty much figuring out the yeah. system as he was writing part Let 3, you can overlook it. Yeah. <laughs> the final thing I want to talk about for part 3 gets a little spoilery, so skip That's to the cool with me. On screen if you want to avoid. As anyone who's seen Stardust Crusaders will tell you, the last part of the series gets pretty dark. Yep. <laughs> the battles get more violent and intense, and the show takes on a far more somber tone. Thank a you far darker and more macabre visual style and colour palette. And tragically, characters who have been with us for nearly the entire they series die. suffer some pretty gruesome and harrowing deaths. It's surprising in a lot of ways, even feeling a little disjointed. In one episode, Jotaro is playing baseball on the Super Nintendo, and in the next, we're introduced to the horrifying Vanilla Ice mm -hmm. and his stand Cream, who is a degree of magnitude more dangerous than anything, anything that's yeah. come up to this point. <sighs> and it leads to one of the most desperate and tragic stand battles of the entire show. This continues right up until the concluding moments of Jotaro's monumental battle with Dio. Oh, it's and so as God. the sun sets on the final scene, it's hard not to feel like the series ends on a somewhat melancholy tone. Mm. I was initially puzzled about why Araki chose to end this series in this manner. And after giving it some thought, here's my conclusion. Mm. When I was a teenager, me and a few friends ended up cycling across France. And while I remember being so excited to reach our goal, when I think back to it now, what stands out for me the most is not the journey's conclusion, but, but all the weird and fun things that, that happened, happened along the way. way. Yeah. And that's the exact feeling I get when I watch Stardust Crusaders. Even though things go very wrong for our heroes in the final act, it's the journey that brought them there and the adventures That's they shared important. along yeah. the way that really matters. Mm -hmm. And I think this is Iraqi's message with part three. The destination will always be far less important than the journey that gets you there. And oddly enough, I think it's this same philosophy that makes Iraqi such a great author. He doesn't see his stories as a beginning point and an end point, but as a journey and one that he takes delight in every single step of. And while reading JoJo's, it's apparent that no one is more excited to see what happens than Araki himself. Yeah. And I think it's this earnest enthusiasm that pushes him to move on from what's come before and to raise his series to new heights. The journey of Stardust Crusaders is a great goddamn story. It is. But even more than so that, good. it represents one of the high points for an author who even despite his previous accomplishments, is willing to entirely reinvent his series and set out on a brand new bizarre adventure all over again. And this, friends, more than any other reason, is why you should watch JoJo's Bizarre Adventure Part 3, Stardust, Stardust Crusaders. So epic. Friends, this draws to a close this video and also this year. A small announcement, I am going to be at MAGFest 2017. I look like this, and I'll be wearing this t-shirt. Follow me on Twitter for more info, but if you do see me, feel free to say hi. That is hi. a cool logo Once that he's again, got. It's a pretty cool logo. I want to thank you for joining me on what has honestly been a very bizarre adventure on my part. Watching this channel grow and gain momentum has honestly been incredible. I love Super and I have videos. some big so plans good. for 2017. Once again, you can of course find me on Twitter at iPatchWolf, 
but maybe you want to check out the Let's Fight a Boss video game podcast for our climactic 2016 Game of the Year showdown, where we'll be taking a look back at 2016 and pitting its best games against each other for the coveted Let's Fight a Boss Game of the Year it's award. A, oh. I'm going to take a God, much needed rest for the next week or two, but I will oh, be back in January. But until then, friends, enjoy doing whatever the hell it is you enjoy doing this holiday season. Take care of yourselves, oh, and I'll see you next week. Oh. So, I do believe he's done one for part four. Part now, blah, blah, blah. Part three is my favourite, but um, I will give you this, because a lot of you were like, part four is the best. Um, the villain in part four was incredible for me, like, whoa. But as a whole storytelling mechanic, I feel like part three is better, because part four's first half for me was like, this is okay, but what's happening? Um, and it's just like, whoa. But yeah, part three for me, that whole journey aspect and everything that goes on with it is just goddamn amazing. And boom. Yeah, so there you go. That's why you should watch part three of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Stardust Crusaders. So yeah, thank you guys very much for uh, for watching. What do you guys think of that? What do you guys think of this? Click like, subscribe if you haven't already. Leave comments down below. You should watch and discuss in future videos. And I'll see you guys. It's all you guys. Next time.